Hello, this is Daryl Ehrlich, and this is the Vietnam Voices, a project sponsored by Master Lube and the Billings Gazette, and it brings together Vietnam veterans to tell their story. Uh, today is February 3rd, 2016, and I am pleased to have Dean Batten in the studio. He was with the U.S. Army from 1970 to 1972. He's got a really, he, he saw amazing things because uh, he was a, a, a dust-off helicopter crew chief. That's all the thunder I'm going to steal. Uh, Dean, thanks so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. He's, he's, uh, he's going to share his story today. So let's start kind of in the same place I start all the stories, which is at the beginning. So where were you in 1970, and what were you doing before you joined the U.S. Army? Well, in 1970, I was living here in Billings. Okay. I was born and raised here, and I graduated from... West High, 1970. Okay. And in July, I entered the service. Okay. And I was only 17 when I entered, so I had to have my dad sign me up. I mean, that's. <laughs> and then I ended up having my 18th birthday in basic training. <laughs> that sounds miserable. Yeah. Did Did you mean? To, so you wanted to sign up? Did this was right, was this part I, of the plan? What? Why? Right. Why did you want to well, sign up for U.S. Army? Um. When I was in high school, they used to have a program at Senior and West, you know, it was called Naval Junior Reserve Officer Training, mm -hmm. and I did three years in that, and I was, uh, we had a color guard, and, and I also was commander of, uh, uh, well, we had a drill team also. Okay. And anyways, I was interested in the military at that time. Uh, I went in Buddy Basic with a friend of mine, and... We went down there, and the Navy guy wasn't there, and we looked at each other and said, no, we're not going Marines, so we decided to go in and talk to the Army recruiter, and, and anyways, I had an interest in helicopters right away because he had a picture of one, and I thought, right. oh, that'd be cool, you know? <laughs> well, anyways. <laughs> had you ever flown in a helicopter? No. no okay, no. well, that's. And anyways, uh, he said, well, if you pass the test, you know. That's what you can get. So anyways, I took the exam, and he said, yeah, you'll qualify for this. And so anyways, we enlisted, went to Fort Lewis, took BASIC. After BASIC, uh, went to Fort Rucker, Alabama, went to aircraft maintenance school there. And the thing about that was you didn't, we, we, it was a six-week program, and you didn't want to miss it, to, or not f or fail a test in there because if you did, you were automatic 11 Brune, 11 Charlie, 11 Echo. And you know, I didn't want to be 11 Bravo, I didn't want to be a grunt, I didn't right. want to be a, on a motor or any of that other stuff. So uh, when I got tired in class, this is a lot of us, we'd get tired in class, we'd go stand at the back of the room and stand and take notes. Yeah, because you did not want to go and be no. just infantry, right? No, no. That, that was what was going to happen. And anyways, uh, my class started out at 56, 45 of us graduated. Okay. And I graduated 15th in my, out of 45, so I think I did pretty well. Yeah, did you have interest in mechanics or interest in Navy? I mean, obviously you, you saw, hey, I like helicopters, but did you have an interest in it already, or was that? Um, somewhat. You know, okay. mechanics and, you know, I I still have a little bit of interest in mechanics, but I'm, I don't know, it's just, I like creating things, I guess. You yeah. Know? So. Were, were you nervous when you enlisted about the Vietnam War? I mean, 70, it, it had been going on for a while. Was that right. something in the back of your mind, or how did you think about that? Um, well, in a way, I kind of thought it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And... Um, my dad was, was in Second World War. He, okay, so you came from some military background. He was in the Battle of the Balls. I got okay. a, a great uncle that's buried at Custer Battlefield. He is a Marine in First World War. He okay. was mustard gassed and died hmm. fairly young from lung cancer. I wonder why. Right. <laughs> and anyways, uh, um, it, it's just one of them things. You know, I just... I just felt like, you know. It was the thing to do. A thing to do, you know. What was turning 18 like in boot camp? That, that seems like a yeah. bad place to spend your 18th, but maybe it wasn't. It I was kind of funny because my mom sent me a chocolate cake, and when I was in boot camp, we couldn't have sweets. Okay. 
And anyways, uh, my drill sergeant, Allen, and uh, he, he said, okay, you know, so. He got kind of on my case, uh, second week I was there, because of ROTC, you could, you could enlist as an, e, e, as an E2 instead of being an E2 or E1, you know? Right. And so I had this bright idea, you know, I'll go talk to the drill sergeants. I had this little paper with me, you know, stating that I completed this. Blah, right. Blah. Well, anyways, I went up to him one day, and he goes, well, let's go see the first sergeant. So we go see the first sergeant. He's not there. I'm a drill sergeant now, and he just looks at my paper and goes just like that, crumples it up, throws it in a gas or in a garbage can. And he goes, I'll make sure he gets it. He says, will there be anything else? And I go, no drill sergeant. And and anyways, <laughs> I walked out of there and I go, man, I'm I'm gonna he's gonna be on my case. And he was on my case for a couple weeks there until we uh, qualified for the M16s. I shot fourth highest in my company. After that, you're fine. You know, he he loved me after that, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> but, oh wow, that has to be kind of shocking. Yeah. Where did you do basic? Did you, did you go to Fort, Fort Lewis? Lewis? Okay. Yeah, got to see Mount Rainier every morning, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And then Fort Rucker. Fort and what, what's Rucker. the hardest thing about uh, you were on aircraft uh, maintenance and, and mechanics? What, what, what's the hard, What was the hardest part for you? The hardest part. Um, I don't know if there were any hard parts. They're okay. just the Hueys are high maintenance. Yeah, what made them high maintenance? Just everything involved. Okay. You got hydraulics, you got special engine oils. I mean, you got push-pull tubes, you got trim tabs on your rotor blades, our main rotor blades that we'd have to use a grease pencil and a pole after every 100 hours, we'd have to push it up and uh, see if the blades are tracking right, and if not, you got to adjust the tabs. and. And then you got split cones on them and swash plates, and if this stuff isn't just perfect, you know, we had uh, fuel filters. Every 25 hours, you had to pull uh, fuel filters and change them. You got to send in an oil sample, engine oil sample, and everything's got safety tie wire on it. And you got uh, slippage marks, they're little painted marks, and you got all these bearings. And I mean, you gotta check them, and it, if they got any kind of, kind of, slack in them, I mean, it's like, man, red exit. You know, it's got to be fixed. And um, we'd we'd send a tail rotor in to have that rebalanced every hundred hours. And I mean, you'd pull all the panels and check the tail rotor cables and. That wasn't fun. I hated doing that, changing tail rotor cables, because they had any fray at all, man. Boom, you know, <clears throat> brand new ones. And you got little holes like that, and a little guy like me, I can get in there, you know? Right. But, you know, uh, when I first got to my unit, you know, it was like, I was a typical FNG. And, right. And I hated that, you know, because everybody go new ass, new guy, or whatever, but, but that was just part of the part of it, you know? Right. So yeah, uh, a, a, after Fort Lewis, right. then what happened? Then where did you go? Did you get in, I went, deployed? I went to Fort Rucker. Okay. And, and then after passed. Fort Rucker, yep. And then I got orders for Vietnam. Was that a, Was that what you were pretty much expecting? If you were in well, Fort Rucker, did you know? When I went to Fort Rucker, they said if anybody signs up for a door gunner school, automatic Vietnam. And so I signed up for a door gunner school. I never went to a door gunner school. They just sent me air. air <laughs> Air, aircraft maintenance school and wouldn't have done me any good anyway. Right. We didn't have guns, so, but. Right. Did you, um, when you were uh, training for for aircraft maintenance, did they only train you on the Hueys or did they train you on the, co just, the just Coverts Huey. or just Hueys? So you were, you were trained for a specific aircraft. Right. right. Okay. And, uh, and so after, after Fort Rucker, then you got your orders to Vietnam. That, doesn't seem like it phased you that you were going to Southeast Asia. You kind of knew that. Is that kind of where you yeah. knew you were going? Yep. Yeah, I got a two-week leave, came home, and and then uh, I left. Uh, Was it hard? Uh, what, what do you do during those two weeks? Well, I just kind of visiting with friends and, 
and family, and it was around Christmas time, so it wasn't too bad. Right. Uh, the hard part was when the day I left here to go to Oakland, uh, my dad was, he was a little teary-eyed at the airport. Yeah. And, you know, in a, in a way I could kind of understand it because, you know, he went to hell in, in the vault. Uh, yeah. They went three days, three days of a pancake a day. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, I kind of knew a little bit, you know. And, I mean, Vietnam was on TV all the time. Yeah, did that scare you at all to see what was going on, or did it excite or what? Oh, how, how did you feel? Because it wasn't, now it wasn't I, just something on the news, right? Yeah, I I, I, I think I knew the risk. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, you might, you, you might come back wounded, you might not make it back alive, you know. But right. that was the risk I was willing to take. I, at that time, I felt I needed to serve my country, and I felt it was an honorable thing to do. So. Sure. So you go to Oakland and then fly, have that long flight, making a couple of stuff. Wow. Yeah. Where did you land? Where, where in Vietnam did you? We landed in, in Benoit. Okay. And they came and got us on buses with these grates on the buses. And, and getting off that plane is like, the heat, a blast of heat and the stench. It was a smell, and I think most of it probably was from all, all the different fuels, and then, and then uh, uh, the burning of human excrement. You know. Right. Yeah. No, we've heard plenty about yeah. that. Yeah. So that, j just uh, someone, one, one of the vets, or maybe several of them, have said. It's just an assault on your senses. It's oh, heat. Yeah. It's everything. It it right. just kind of overwhelms you. Yeah. Did you land there in the daytime or was it night or when did we, you land we in landed Benoit? In the daytime. Okay. And uh, all I remember is walking off the plane and looking like, wow, oh, whoa, man. It was <laughs> like, oh man, is it hot? And the next thing I know, this Air Force sergeant is he's screaming and yelling at me, you know, and it's like get the heck off here, because I guess we went in on a Flying Tigers, that was the airline took us in, and we went on Flying Tigers, and and uh, I guess they had rockets coming in or something, so they wanted everybody off wow. the plane, you know. Welcome to Vietnam, right? And it was, I think that was a pretty common thing. Right. You know? So you get off, and you get on these buses that have grates, then what? Uh, then we went to uh, Long Bend. And, uh, or no, we stayed at Benoit until I got orders. I was there for like a day or two. Okay. And I, I think a day, and then I went to Long Bend. Okay. I was originally signed to the 45th Med Company. Okay. And when I got there, I went into the orderly room and met the uh, XO, and um, I was talking to him and the orderlies in there, and I said, well, they said, oh, you're, 67 Alpha, you know, and I said, yeah, but I want to be a crew chief, you know, and they looked at me, you know, I'm like, huh? And they said, you want a crew? And I go, oh, absolutely, you know. And uh, anyways, the LT goes, well, come on, let's go talk to first sergeant. So I went in there and talked to first sergeant. He said, this guy, this gentleman wants the crew, and he goes, oh, yeah, and he's like, okay, well, send him up north, you know. So anyways, uh, that next morning, um, my XO from 247th unit I was signed with, med detachment, it was Captain Hartman, he was down there, and uh, they were picking up a, a new ship, and anyways, that was my was introduction, so. Oh. Well, what was the, so then you flew, and, and where was the 247th stationed out of? Or? We were stationed at Fanrang Air Base. Okay. Tell and me your first impressions of that, um, once, you, once you flew up there. Uh, the base, it was Air Force Base. The first impression is like this pretty big operation here, because mm -hmm. you got all kinds of helicopters there. You got Air Force helicopters. You got 192nd Salt Helicopter Company there, right next to us. We had six birds, and anyways, it was you know they're in revetments, 50-gallon barrels, 
you know, full of sand, sandbag, you know, I mean, it was barbed wire. I mean, it was hangers all over the place, you know, F4s taking off all the time. C-130s, C-131s coming in, you know, I mean, it was, it was a lot going place, on. Yeah. A lot going on, and it was like, whoa, you know. <laughs> <laughs> was it disorienting? It would seem like I'm in this new uh, place. I'm not sure what's going on in all of this action around me. It would seem yeah. to be kind of a, a disorienting yeah. process. At, yeah, at first it was, like, overwhelming to me, you know. Yeah. I mean, here I am, an 18-year-old kid from Montana, you know, yeah. pretty sheltered life, really, you know, and it's like, whoa. What did I get into? <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first to have said that, Dean. Yeah. We've had a lot of people yeah. said what I got over there and was, whoa. Yeah. yeah. So then what? Uh, then what happens? Uh, did you be? Uh, well, I did 90 days um, on the job training okay. and aircraft maintenance. Okay. And like I said, you know, we 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 uh, every hundred hours, aircraft has major maintenance on it. So that's where I learned how to how to do all the stuff that I needed to know. And right. cause like I said, you got, you got all your filters and your slippage marks. You got your push pull tubes. You got grease, all this stuff all the time. You got to inspect your, you got to inspect everything all the time. And you, you got to pay, pay particular attention to the hydraulics, you know, that kind of stuff. Cause that's what runs your transmission, you know? Right. And, uh, yeah, there was a few times I got to change rotor blades because they'd, they'd have bullet holes in them. So, hmm. anyways, got a Jesus nut that holds everything down. That's right. That's one of and, the best terms of the And uh, got to learn how to torque them down. What's, the, my, what's the key to torquing down a Jesus nut? Um, the key, I don't even remember how many foot pounds that was, but I remember my maintenance sergeant, he was a good sized guy, and we'd, we'd put a cheater bar on it. Okay. You know, and uh, me and him, it was like first time I got to do that, I thought it was pretty pretty fun, you know. Right. And because uh, you got a crane and you got to change everything, take everything off. And, but it was, it was a lot of work and. Um, just high maintenance. I think they cost like three hundred bucks an hour to keep you, keep a Huey going. Huh. And, and so did you? So you, you got there, and uh, let's talk about what exactly your job was as crew chief. So it's maintenance. It's keeping, keeping, make making sure the UH one. And was this the UH one D or the UH one? UH one H. Yeah, well, UH one H. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this was, uh, w what's your job? And then talk about a meta, uh, t talk about being w what you did and what, what this helicopter, what these missions were. So let's talk a little bit about that. All right. Well, anyway, like I said, I did 90 days on job training yeah. and then I did probably another month, month and a half, um, just doing maintenance. And I knew they kept telling me, well, I made spec fourth third month I was there because you had to be spec four to be a crew chief. Okay. So anyways, uh, I started crewing in, in, in May of 1971. And anyways, the first week I crewed was, was pretty simple. Uh, we had two operations in, in, in our unit. We had first up and second up. First up, did all the primary missions, and then second up, covered first up if either they're gone or they're at chow or, or something's going on or or something. Uh, we did patient transfer second up, and basically, you know, somebody had to go to personnel or you had this or that to do, we'd, we'd run them up to Cameron so they'd go to finance or whatever or get ready to go back to the world. Anyways, uh, First week I went down to Long Bend for 58th Med Italian. We had a bunch of stuff to do down there, so uh, they needed some paperwork. and We had to get some paperwork, I guess, so that's when I kind of started flying. And we sat on, well, you got your pilot and co-pilot. I think we were kind of opposite of what assault helicopters flew. Mm -hmm. You got your pilot. We call them ACs, aircraft commanders, and then the co-pilot, we call them Peter pilots, and they're usually the newer guys that come in. 
and uh, newer pilots, and to get so many hours, then they make AC. But anyways, uh, my first week, I was just kind of just kind of doing VS missions, you know, not much. Well, then my second week, I st I started crewing with uh, Sanders because his his crew chief went home on extended leave, and uh, he was a black medic from Charleston, South Carolina, Fort Tour medic. Wow. And he's a pretty good sized guy. Well, anyways, we, we started doing missions, and uh, I remember one time, I, it was like first week, I, saw, I first kind of got broke in, you know, picking up wounded, and, and anyways, uh, I remember it was like 2.30 in the morning, we needed to do a refill, and Song Mao was a, they had a little engineer camp there, and we do hot refuels there, but you had this generator and you got to start it, and it was one of them old rope type ones where right, you got to right. wrap a rope around it and pull it. Right. Well, it was about the second pull, you know, it's not it's not firing up, you know. I started wrapping a rope around it again for the third pull, and I go, wow, fireflies, you know. And so I pulled it, and I turned around, and I was going, damn it, fireflies, and the next thing I knew was Sandy's got a hold of me, and I, I heard the, the uh, aircraft, they started winding up because the 6,600 R 6, RPMs was flight idle, but they started cranking up, and I think that's what got my attention when I turned around, and the next thing I knew, Sandy's got me. I mean, he's, he's like carrying me. I'm trying to run, but he's like carrying me, you know, throws me in the helicopter, flies in on top of me, and we're gone, you know, and I got plugged in, and the pilot goes, AC goes, we almost left you, boy. And it was like, it was like, after that, if I heard that, that engine start winding up, man, it didn't matter, man. I'm dropping a patient, whatever, man. I'm getting the hell out of there, man, because I ain't getting left, you know. And right, was, those were you know, tracers, correct? Right, That's green, what. That's green. what we've I heard. Yeah. I've heard more than one person yeah. say when they're new in country, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, what, what pretty fireflies. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, uh, so that was kind of my my beginning um and so when you were a crew chief you're you're along with a medic right. a dust off helicopter is a is a meta is a medevac flight but you don't have guns on no right? but you do have the red cross right to symbolize that you're a medic right. so your your goal was either transport or a lot of times it was picking up wounded in the right. field correct and, and transporting them to a Field hospital. hospital or a hospital. What was the closest? Uh, what was the closest field hospital to you? Um, for Americans, it was uh, uh, Cameron. It had an Air Force hospital there. Okay. And and and, uh, and the medic on board would take care of them once they got on board. Right. Until they got there. Right. Right. What was the topo? What did it look like where you were at? What, did, what kind of well, we were, I was in two corps, so okay. we had like twenty thousand square mile operation with six birds. So, like dust off flew for all units. Medevacs only flew for the units assigned to, and they had guns, like you, mm -hmm. like you were just saying. But uh, a lot of triple canopy jungle, and then if you get down by Fantiet and Whiskey Mountain, that area, a lot of. Uh, Rice patties, things like okay. that. What's, what, what uh, from a, as a kid from Montana? What did you think of how the the how Vietnam looked? I thought it was pretty. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I thought you know some of it, the mountains, you know, around the Trang, they kind of reminded me of Montana a little bit. Okay. But then when you get into the triple canopy jungles and you, uh, the farther west you go, it's it's like desolate man so, yeah. yeah what about okay so let's talk a little bit about now you've got a red cross on your on your, both on your nose and do you have one do you have them on the tail on the, too on, the, on, the, on the doors on the doors and sometimes like we we'd end up losing doors and then you know if you lose one door you got to take the other one off and sometimes we'd have to fly for a while until we could get another door but uh yeah, they had them on the bottoms also. Did that stop you from becoming a target? Um, no. 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 Uh, are mostly are when you're getting taken fire? Is it mostly VC or is it NVA? 
Oh, I, I, I think most of where I was at was normally probably Viet, Viet Cong. Viet Cong. Yeah. Well, so what's an average mission, uh, medical mission like? What, what, just let's we'll kind of walk through. How, how did one of those go down? How, how did this happen? Well, we had three, three, three different kinds. We had uh, basically. I, I'll start out this way. Okay. This, this is who we served. We served U.S. Army. We served U.S. Marines. We served, uh, we'd, uh, they had a SEAL team in Baylock when I first got there, and then, then they kind of stood down. So I was wondering, what's the Navy doing here? That, I mean, that's how naive I was when I first got to Vietnam. <laughs> and, and anyways, uh, we, we did look sometimes for Zumi pilots down or, or C-130s out of crash. Sometimes we'd look for them. We served uh, Arvins, Arvin Rangers, Koreans. We call them rock soldiers. Yep. They were White Horse Division. We, we worked a lot with the Koreans. And anyways, Arvins and Koreans, we had interpreters a lot of the time, night missions. Um, then we picked up civilians, mama son sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pregnant or whatever. There's one I'll tell you about. Sure a mission here in a little mm -hmm. bit. But anyways, we had, like I said, Fan Rang, we had first, second up, and then we had standbys at Trang, Bamatui East, and Whiskey Mountain, which is down by Fan Tiet. And anyways, uh, we were all the time just getting stuff, night or day. We flew any kind of weather, night or day, any time. And uh, basic mission, I mean, you might be working on your bird, cleaning it up or something like that, and you got a mission, boom, you know, you're gone. And uh, uh, basically, you just headed, headed for a pickup, and usually me and my medic, we'd, we'd turn the radios on, we'd be listening to AFV and radio. I mean, you'd be listening to... Uh, who knows? The Doors, The Who, okay. The Beatles. I mean, you'd be listening to some Motown music. Yeah. Motown was real big in Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, next thing you know, you got AC comes on. Okay, everybody on one, and we all switch on one, so everybody's talking. And you know, I'm I'm here. I got okay. Clear down right, clear up right, whatever you know. But. The medic, same thing, and you know, we had three different kinds of pickups. We'd go in and land in an LZ, and some of them, you know, I mean, firefight's already over. Some of them, you go in, they're hot, and they'd tell us, we're going in hot. And then we had hoist missions and hover holes. A hover hole, you just hover down. Um, usually, the Arvins, they'd take patient, wrap them in a poncho, and tie it to a, a log about, oh, yeah, big round, I guess. And then, good thing, uh, my unit, we had steps on our helicopters, and so you could jump down on the steps and reach down and, and pull them up you know, into the helicopter, and boy, uh, then you got your hoist missions, where we drop penetrator down 7,500 foot, you know, treetop level. Uh, I'm sitting up there on them steps with a cable, you know, wow. with the handheld operator, you know, dropping this penetrator down into the three pong, open up, and you, uh, yeah. Uh, now, are you roped in? Or are you tied in? Or you, if you no, slip, no. Uh, we we they told us, you know, you need you can wear a monkey belt and never did. It, no, I it got in the way. I I tried it once and it got in the way, you know, and. Uh, it's just big hassle. This way I can move around. I'm more mobile. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's, it's kind of like being like a little daredevil, you know. Hey, you can't get me, you know. But anyways, you're sitting on the steps and you're pulling these guys up. And I remember one time pulling a couple guys up for 101st, you know, out in the train. And, uh, man, I remember when we got eye level. It was like their eyes were big as sizes, man. They were like, oh, you know. And anyways, I jumped back in and, and grabbed the cable and pulled them in, you know, back into the hell hole. And uh, they they got unbuckled. But uh, yeah, and it's like, you, we usually went in and most time you went in 
and you'd load patients and boom, you're gone. I mean, we didn't want to spend more than two minutes because I think our dust off average life expectancy was 90 seconds. I mean, it was high rate. They said that uh, I think dust off took three times more losses than than yeah. regular. Rip did it? Uh, how did that work? I mean, isn't that? Did you have any protection or any cover if you landed in a if you went in hot, which means that you're under only, fire? The only protection you didn't have any. Had, the only protection we had was, well, you got a forty pound porcelain vest, and you got an M sixteen. Some some of the guys had M seventy nines and Car fifteens, things like that. Shot off M sixteens with grenade launchers on them. Pilots, they always had thirty eight shoulder holster and and uh, they carried side arms, right? You know, rifles. You know. So hmm. that's so, that's how so, so there was just no. Uh, w was it a vulnerable feeling that you you were going in there and not necessarily being protected? Well, if they were. They were too hot, we'd get gun support. Okay. You'd, you'd have you'd gun chips. Assault, yeah, yeah, you'd have a salt helicopter flying over you, giving you gun support if it got too hot. Um, fortunately, I was never shot down, but I think I come close to it one night down at Whiskey Mountain. We had an armor compound that got, got rocketed. And <coughs> 2.30 in the morning, we go in there and Two mama sons got their baby sons, got shrapnel wounds. Mm. You know, little Tyler kids. You know. Yeah. I mean, they're crying, they're bleeding, you know, it's like, you know. So anyway, we get them loaded up, and as soon as we left the LZ, kaboom, like that, you know. A rock, another rocket come in, and took out a rotor wash, put us in a tailspin. I'm going, holy crap, man, you know. I just grabbed that mama, I thought we were going down, you know. How did you uh, How did you get out of that? So if they knock out your uh, rotor, your tail rotor. Uh, no, we didn't. No, we went a tail rotor spin. Okay. We took out a rotor wash. Oh, okay. You know, that's yep. the rotor wash is what yep. keeps you going yep. in the air. But we lost a rotor wash, put us in a tail spin, so we're spinning around like that, and that's when I thought we were going down. And uh, Lieutenant Hogan, he he uh, he managed to pull us out of it, and just just you know, it, just it right time i guess you know hmm. i gotta say the lord has his hand on all of us so right right so he got it going again and so he got it going again and we got out of there but uh yeah that's the wow but anyways you know i pull in hoist missions you know you, you got your i mean i'm so involved what's going on everybody you know medic he's just worried about you know, not getting any blade strikes, and the pilots are telling, hurry up, hurry up, you know, because they're getting nervous, and and then you hear that rotor blade start whistling, you know, then you, yep. that uh, things aren't good. Because it's been hit, right? Uh, the, when yeah. the rotor starts whistling, that means you got a hole in it? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah we're taking rounds, we're taking fire, you know, and it's like... Okay. And then sometimes, you know, they'd, they'd come to the... You'd, you'd, you'd be getting them to the uh, uh, bubbles in the front, or they'd be coming through litter poles. <clears throat> um, just crazy. Yeah, we had one, one pilot, Lieutenant Walker, he went in an LZ one time, and he had a bullet, I guess it went through a litter pole, and hit his head and spun around, went down his face shield and landed in his lap. Hmm. And, yeah, I mean, wow. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> to the norm, huh? Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> when, that, but, when that happens, you know, when you lose a rotor wash and stuff, does it happen? Does it seem like it, uh, does that, does time slow down, speed up? Or what, what, what's that like when, when you're kind of getting an emergency situation? I don't know. It just... I, I just, when that happened, I just thought, this is it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But And it's 2.30 in the morning. Can you see anything? I mean, is it dark? It's no, dark. Really, it's dark. Oh. Right. So uh, let's talk, what, what was your opinion of the rocks and the Arvin? So, since you're working, you're, you're, a, you're one of the, the soldiers who actually worked with other, other right. nationalities. Right. So what, what, was, what did you think of them? Uh, basically... I think the rock soldiers, uh, 
they were basically what you call a badass. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys were all black belts in Taekwondo. Right. I mean, you, you didn't mess around with rock soldiers. And, you know, they didn't mess around with, uh, with uh, Viet Cong or prisoners, you know. Right. And I, I, I learned that real quick. You know, these, these guys are hard. Yeah. Uh, we had interpreters sometimes with us, and sometimes we didn't. But when when the rocks called, you know, we were there, and and uh, uh, just. What about the Arvin? The Arvins, the Arvin Rangers. I liked working with them. Right. And and some of the Arvins were okay, but towards the end, when see when I got there, in seventy one, Nixon wanted to start. Vietnamization that started halfway through, mm -hmm. and towards the end of my tour, uh, I wasn't real hell bent working with Darwin's, huh? right? Because a lot of times you have to unplug, because mm -hmm. and they'd want to DD off, and we'd have, me and my medic have to unplug and go grab some some bodies, you know. And it's like, you know, I, I wasn't real fond of that, but I think. Most of them were pretty good. I remember one time I went in an LZ and we were supposed to get three or four pickups when one POW, Viet Cong POW. Anyways, they brought two guys in and we let them litter. We had litter poles and we could carry three litters on there. And if there's too many of them, you just start throwing them in and get the hell out of there, you know, and then right. sort them out, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, anyways. But anyways, they had this Viet Cong prisoner, and they brought him up to the helicopter, and we were going to load him on, and then this Arvin Dowie, or lieutenant, he grabbed him by the hair, pulled him off, kicked him down, and I'm going, I'm just standing there on the other side and watching this and go, what the heck, you know? And uh, next thing they knew, they brought this other guy up, and that was still a hot LZ because I can see the the guy standing not too far from us, you know, and they're boom, like that. And, and it was like, this all happened just a matter of minutes, man. Boom, 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 you know, hmm. boom. And we grabbed this one guy and, I mean, it was, it was ugly. Hmm. And uh, we got out of there and when we flew off, we could see them. When I went in, there was a lot of tree lines there and, some rice paddies, but when we flew off, we were about a, probably a mild click down the road from the LZ, and there was three Viet Cong, and they were carrying one. He was wounded. Hmm. And I grabbed my 16, I was gonna lock and load on them suckers, man, right. but the helicopter started going, to, so anyways. Hmm. But it was like, you know, I just had that instinct then, you know, and it was like, this ain't why I'm here, you know. Right, you right. Know? Now you had a volunteer to be uh, a member of, of a dust, dust off, off right? right? Tell me about that. Tell me how how do you volunteer, and tell me why it's volunteer. Um, well, the pilots went to basic uh, flight school, and then they had to go to dust off school, and the army took top ten percent. Hmm. You know, medics they had to volunteer for it. Crew chiefs, we just kind of got. Um, picked for it, you know. Okay. You volunteer for Vietnam. I mean, your hard what your, your chance of going. Yeah, how many? Uh, your, your a dust off crew chief being on a dust off was very very um, dangerous because you're going into hot areas and you were unarmed, right? Right. Did you tell your parents uh, when when you wrote home and said, "Here's what I'm doing"? Did you mention no, that? No, I don't think I did. You know. <laughs> okay. I, I I don't think I. You know, I didn't want to worry my folks. You know, I I think they knew. I did tell them I was crew chief, though. Uh, okay. On a, on a air ambulance, you know? so I think they had a pretty good idea. Yeah, what was going on? Yeah. What did you? Um, uh, when you were over there and you're listening to music, are, uh, you mentioned the songs, and we've had a lot of the, the the soldiers, the veterans, mention you know that they like they they remember the music over there. It's a good time for music. Is there any song that you hear today that that reminds you of Vietnam, or any artist? Oh, there's a whole bunch of them. Okay. But uh, Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Okay. Um, yeah. That that one. Um, Um, 
My Girl. Yeah. You know, Jackson 5. Uh, so when you were over there, um, you were going all day, all night, too? Is that it just whenever whenever something right. happened? Yeah, you know, some days, I mean, they, they're just like, you, you didn't hardly even get any sleep sometimes, you know? Hmm. I mean, you get up 5.30 in the morning, and you daily your aircraft, and you got any maintenance to do on it. You know, you're always cleaning stuff. Um, and you, you might have opportunity to go to child, come back. You might not have anything for that afternoon. But hmm. then it might, when it, things start winding up, it's like, it's like you just go lay on your bed and unzip your Nomac, throw it off. You just lay on your bed and you crash <laughs> out and, and hope you get some sleep. And because uh, <clears throat> We had a lot of night missions. It always seemed like 2, 3 in the morning, you know, from there to 4 o'clock in the morning. It's like pfft, nonstop, you know. And you'd be <clears throat> going in, picking up, and then you have to go back in, same same LZ, you know, same area, and pick up more. I mean, it's just, it got hectic. And uh, I know, oh, Viet Cong or NVA, they, they they just play games with us too. They'd uh, they pop smoke. And we'd have to identify the color, you know. Right. Yeah. The color. Well, you got a green smoke and a yellow smoke. And it's like what the heck, you know? And it's like so right. you knew, man. The pilots would get all nervous, boom, like that. We're gone, you know. And, and then we'd have to make another approach. But I mean, yeah, they they. they Pull crap like that on us a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, because and you'd have to pay attention to what smoke yeah. you were landing on. What? Tell me a little bit about um, what was the most kind of uh, the common kind of injury that you had a medevac for? Uh, I'd say, God, dude. I mean, it, it, everything. Okay. I mean, you, you can't imagine. You, know, it's, it, you guys looked like they run through a meat grinder or something. Really? Yeah, it was horrible. What um? But so you a lot you a lot of lot of gunshot wounds, chest, stomach, you know. Okay, a lot of shrapnel too, I imagine. Um, sometimes, yeah. What uh? So you were really firsthand. You you, you really saw what war does to people. Right. I mean, there was there is no missing yeah, it for you. To this day, I was I still won't eat Spanish rice. To mm. this day. Yeah. And the reason for that is. Um. You go in a LZ and you pick up, pick up some Arvins that wounded. They got head wounds, other kind of wounds, and the medic's working on them. And he's telling you, "You got to help me here." So you end up giving them Arvin mouth to mouth, and next thing you know, you got a mouth full of blood and rice. And it's like, you know, yeah, it was like to this day I can't stand. Yeah, Spanish rice. It just. It Reminds just puts me right back there, you know. Huh. I don't like it. What is the, um, was it, are you loading both dead and living on the medevacs, or how does that go? How does that work? So you're loading whatever needs to be out. What, whatever needs to be out. And um, how do you not let that get to you day in, day out? Oh, I don't know. It was all in a day's work, the way I look yeah. at it. I think, you know, um, spirit decor of, Dust off crews were high, I think. Yeah. Um, we just looked at it doing our job, you know. Right. It was a unit motto, save a life, and and uh, that's what we tried to do. Um, there was there were some real sad times. Uh, I used to get upset because every now and then, you know, my patients they'd lose, or my medics would lose a patient. And yeah. They they'd cry. Yeah. You know, sometimes, and that used to bother me. I didn't like it, you know. That they cried or lost a patient, which one? Um, that they cried, mm -hmm. you know, because I just, it's like, well, we ain't got time for this. Okay. And uh, it hardened me. Yeah, you yeah, think, yeah. It did. Does it, um, uh, were the, when, when, when they'd come on, uh, when they were wounded, did, did they, did they know what was happening to them, or were they, by the time oh, you got, yeah. okay, so they yeah, knew they were being loaded in a yeah, dust off and, yeah. and gotten out of there. Uh, I, I'm guessing it's so loud and you're so busy, you're not really talking to them or communicating with them, are you? 
Um, usually not. Mm -hmm. But I remember one time we did pick up an Arvin, Arvin lieutenant or Dowie. You know, he had chest wall and he, he goes, this is my second time. And, and uh, anyways, he could speak pretty good English. Hmm. So I kneeled down, you know, like that, and uh, bend down, and and uh, he ended up giving me his his hat and had a bunch of Vietnamese writing on it, hmm. and I had that hat for a long time. It ended up losing eventually, but yeah, you know, right. It was like that was his thank you for for getting him out. And yeah. So. Uh, did 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 they? Um, uh, is there any that you were amazed? Uh, I imagine you saw a lot of bad wounds. Are there were there ones that you were amazed that lived, um, or did you not know? A lot of them we didn't know. Okay, I think one of the things that was kind of a turning point for me. Mm -hmm. um, I had to go pick up an engineer down at Song Mao. Okay, and uh, we picked him up in leather restraints. He had rabies, hmm. and he died three days later. Wow. We, we took him to Cameron, dropped him off, and uh, he, he we, we found out three days later that he had died. Hmm. And then I had to go get the dog the same day, drop him off and go back and get the dog, a little, little metal case, a little white dog. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> wow. But, uh, yeah, um, that kind of turning point for me because I started questioning. I was like, what are we doing here? Yeah, you know the census. Is, there's, there's no reason somebody should be dying from rabies. You know, <laughs> right? And right. Uh, yeah, that was kind of a turning point for me. But luckily, that was you know, I uh, I don't know. I, I just the uh, ugliness of war. It's it's. Uh, yeah, you saw it, you saw it firsthand. Would it, when people talk about war, you've seen it in a you've seen it in all of its vicious. And all of its viciousness. When when people talk about war, what what do you what are some of your thoughts? Because you've seen it like very few people have. Is it? It's got to be horrifying. Something that you never want to return to. I'm guessing. I've seen enough. I've Probably more seen. than I should have. Yeah, and how old were you? You were only 19, 18, 19. 19. How do you deal with this as an 18, 19 year old, and 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 how do you process it the rest of your life? Well, it hasn't been easy. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been easy. But, you know, there's, I've had some help along the way. Yeah. And have, having a good wife, too. Has Probably been helped. a real blessing, yeah. Yeah. What's the... Um, I, uh, I had some problems in my first marriage, you know, and was, I gave up drinking 30 years ago. Okay. And that's probably uh, I. I just I didn't give it up. I think the Lord delivered me from it. But, yeah. Did, I mean, it, did and and I don't want to assume here, so I'll ask the question. Did you drink to get away from that? Do you think, or some I of the memories? So yeah. Is that a fair? Yeah, okay. I, I I think so. I think a lot of guys drank heavy over there and just cr come on back, <laughs> same old nonsense. Right. And then, and then the sad part of it is like uh, you just can't. Um, things in Vietnam, it's like everything was, I mean, it was, some of it was pretty nutty, you know. Yeah. Like, like give me somebody, an example. Somebody would get mad. I mean, the, the one they said, it's all a helicopter company, you know, like they were right next door to us, but somebody would get PO'd at the first sergeant and then try to frag him, you know. I mean, it's nonsense. I mean, that kind of, you always heard about that because some officers getting fragged. I mean, why you know we're we're not there to kill each other, but yeah, but the tensions ran high yeah, and the stress. It is, yeah. What's the um, uh, what kind of relationship did you have with the? Now you flew all as a crew, the same medic and the same AC and well, the same co-pilot, or did it all rotate, or how it, did that it, work? It was changing all the time. You know, like once one week you might go on standby at Whiskey Mountain, and you'd have a medic and two pilots, and a week later you might have the same medic and sometimes for months and and uh, you'd fly together and then you got a different medic and we had 16 pilots so it changed off and on. Did, did you get along with the pilot? Was there a good uh, guy? We, oh, we had great pilots. So, yeah, like uh, 
Captain Hartman, he was our XO, and you know, he was hilarious. And uh, we had Mr. Werner, we called him Crash, and reason being, you know, shot down. And uh, Mr. Francis, and Mr. Jones, and Mr. Thomas, and them latter two were both black, and, and Captain Bunch, he was our CO. Every six months we got a new CO, and then we got Captain Matt, he come in, he was black. And he was, he was a real fair guy too. So was my first sergeant. He was black, for tour medic. Yeah. Um, All right. Sergeant, and first two tours he was with, first calf, combat medic, and then he did two tours with dust off. But second, or he was first sergeant, active first sergeant. And, um, Let's see, most of the officers, we call them by their first names. Okay. You know, the Warren officers. And I, I had a nickname called Batman. I don't know why I got that, but Sanders gave me that. Okay. And uh, Crowley, he was our, our uh, Gerald Crowley, he's from Penn, Pittsburgh. And anyways, uh, he painted Batman on the back of my flight helmet. <laughs> So I wish I had a picture of that today. <laughs> it was pretty cool, you know. I had a Batman on the back of my flight. Oh, it was hilarious. But I don't know. I got the nickname Batman, and it just, you know, Santa started calling me Batman, and everybody starts calling me Batman, you know. Those things just kind of stick. And, and, and anyways, I thought it was kind of cool. Got a Batman. It's like my friend down in Denver. He's, he said, well, he says, why would you paint your, because he's from Denver, and Denver Broncos, mm -hmm. you know, and. and he said, why would you paint your helmet orange? You, know? he said, you want to be a target, you know what I mean? But, you know, we were kids, 18-year-old kids. I was the youngest guy in my unit the whole time in Vietnam, though. Hmm. And my, my, my buddy in Denver, and we're still, we're like brothers today still. His family was like a second mom and dad to me, but uh, he was only three months, 88 days older than me. So, <laughs> so uh yeah, being the youngest guy in my unit the whole time I was there, you know, it was Wow. What did you um what did you miss most about Montana when you were over there? Um or home. My mom's cooking probably. I've heard that. <laughs> what most? <laughs> anything in particular? You know? Anything particular about your mom's uh, cooking? Boy, everything my mom made was good. She yeah. she grew up in Livingston on a on a ranch, so uh she you know She could cook. Was, oh yeah. Cook and bake, you know, it's like apple pie and rhubarb pie. I tell you, she made great cakes and just just good cook, you know. Right. And nothing real outlandish, just basic good, good food. food right. Know? What a you know, a lot of times what we've talked about with guys here too is they've said, you know, over there they talk about the world, getting back to the world, yeah. as if Vietnam were a different planet, right. and it kind of was. I, I get the. Yeah. The big PX. That's the, the big PX. Yeah. When you got, <laughs> when you got back home, what did you uh, finish this this thought for me? As you would have answered back then, when I get back, I'm going to. What were you going to do when you get back? How would you finish that? Um. Jeez, boy, that's a tough one for me. Okay. But um. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I miss my family and friends for one. Yeah. But then the guys, you know, they'd go on special leave and come back for extensions and stuff like that, you know, and they come back and They'd be talking about women wearing hot pants. What are hot pants? You know? <laughs> I was, was kind of excited about getting back and seeing these gals wearing hot pants, you know. So, anyways, I mean, just things like that, you know. It's like, wow, I was get to see some real round eye, you know. And uh, I don't mean to be derogatory for the Vietnamese, but in a way, you know, I think back today, and I got some friends that are Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And I think and people had it bad, man. They did, you know. In what way? I mean, just um, well, you got two forces on you all the time. Yeah. You got the Americans, mm -hmm. and then you got the NVA and Viet Cong. Yeah. And uh, it's like 
I had a friend years ago, he passed away, but I think he probably did, he was a young lieutenant back in 66. Mm -hmm. His name was Steve Mason, and he was an author, he's written some books, but he mm -hmm. was a poet laureate for Vietnam Veterans America. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to know him pretty well, but anyways, he told me, he said, they went in this, this bill and the baby son, they, they went in there and because they were having contact with Americans, they went in there and cut her arms and legs off, you know, and trying to get, you know, information right. on the pop son. And then they shot Papa son and then the mama son, they shot her and then they, she was pregnant and they cut the baby out of her stomach and built a fire in her stomach. You know? I mean, you, you know, you, you hear people like John Kerry come back and talk about atrocities in Vietnam. Well, the Vietnamese were worse, believe me, far worse. Yeah. Yeah, it, was, it just sounds like a miserable condition. It was, you know. Did you get much interaction with the average Vietnamese person or were you... Uh, did you well, we had um, hooch maids that come in mm -hmm. and wash our uniforms and, and shine our boots and clean our rooms and... I was fortunate being in aviation, you know, we, we had a bed to sleep on most yeah. of the time. Did you, uh, did you, w were you ever getting, you know, sometimes, one of the things that we've heard is oftentimes when you tried to sleep, you'd get mortared or rocketed or something like that. Was that a thing where you were or were you pretty um, safe because it was a larger installation? Well, the good thing being about, um, Van Rang Air Base was, yeah, they got a lot of rocket attacks. Okay. But, but the Air Force, they had their own guard dogs, and they did their own guard. We didn't have to get involved in that. Only if uh, you had um, sappers coming through the wires would we have to go get a flak jacket and helmet and M16. Right. And uh, that, that happened a few times, but, you know, nothing, nothing egregious. But, um, yeah, um, down at Whiskey Mountain, once in a while, we'd get rockets there. And then uh, they'd come up to the perimeters and they'd turn the Claymore mines around. Okay. Just to let us know we were there. And then hang a Chai Com grenade on a wire, you know. And the sergeant, you know, they go out and check the wire. And go, well, Charlie was here last night and we didn't know, you know. Right. They just mess with you. Some of it was psychological. Uh, yeah. A lot of it was psychological. But it was amazing, you know. But do did did you did uh let's let's talk a little bit about um uh good times were were there were there good times in vietnam for you yeah uh we had a black guy from miami florida we call him brother john but his name is james richard johnson but anyway we call him brother john and uh he was a real character and he worked in supply and uh he got to know a bunch of the people over there at the Air Force, and uh, he'd be trading them stuff. And we'd get cases of steaks and chicken and ribs or whatever. So we'd have a little barbecue, unit barbecue, and uh, you know, play some music outside and just kind of unwind a little bit. Right. Uh, Drink, drink some Budweiser. Yeah. So, but so you could get a, but you could get Budweiser. Over oh there. yeah, we got lots of Bud. You know, <laughs> Budweiser. Yeah. So there was at least some decent beer in Vietnam because I've right. heard varying reports on whether yeah. there's decent beer yeah. in Vietnam. Yeah. Was there, um, uh, uh, was there any downtime in Vietnam, or were you, uh, was that? Uh, how, how I did took you, one weekend off and I went to uh, uh, up to Delat, the old French capital. Okay. And went up there and messed around for a weekend. We rented some paddle boats and went out on the lake and paddle boats goofing off, you know, and, and just, you know, just t try to forget a little bit about about what was going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Went to this one French restaurant and well, it was Vietnamese, but it was old French restaurant and had steak dinner there and drank some Bombay Bombay Air Thirty Three, you know. Right. And uh, you know. But other than that, you know, it's most time just pfft. doing we're, time. Yeah, we're we're doing time. You know. When you started to get short, let's talk about that. 
Uh, was that hard? Was it harder to do what you're doing? Because it's a dangerous job, and then you're getting short, so you well, can almost see the end coming, right? Um, yeah. Um, me, I flew up. I knew I was going to get a. I was told I was going to get a. Um, early out. Like not early out, but Operation Santa Claus. Okay. They told me in November. 71 that we're operation santa claus is coming up you're gonna you're gonna probably get go home for christmas hmm. and so end of november i i quit flying okay so i had 16 days left so yeah i just worked on aircraft and used a lawnmower cut some grass in the revetments things like that <laughs> you know, first started it made me keep, he kept me busy you know he's not going to let me sit around you know so, right right but, so what was it like leaving vietnam tell me about that well every time everybody left vietnam in my unit we'd have what you call a dust off send off yeah and, tell explain and that and it, a dust off send off is everybody in the unit well you go out and get in your helicopter and whoever's going with you you know cuz there used to be a couple guys leaving the same time or close to it and uh, everybody in the unit would go out there on the flight line and uh, helicopter take off and we'd pop some smokes and then they'd come flying, flying over the, over the smokes and everybody would wave, you know, and, and uh, then we'd go to Cameron and you're there a few days and processing your orders or whatever and catch Freedom Bird. What was, uh, was it sad leaving Vietnam? Was it what? Was it sad leaving, uh, leaving all the guys? Yeah, in a way it was. In a way it was hard. In a way I was glad. You know, it was like, well, I'm done with this. Um, yeah. Never, did you think about doing another tour? Um, no. No? I, I just, I think one tour was enough for me. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, don't. some of them guys, you know, to, Three, four, or five tours. I don't know how they did it. And then I, I feel bad for these guys today, you know. I mean, they're mandatory three, four tours, you know. It's like, yeah, it's too much. Yeah. What did you, uh, so once you got on that Freedom Bird, what was that like? Oh, yeah, that was, it was great. It was big roar. Yeah? Yeah, big roar. When did that roar happen? Yeah, it happened at night. Okay. And so then you flew all the way home, and tell me about uh, tell me about the the separation process, and where'd you go, and and what was uh, well, coming home I, like? Well, I, we we flew in SeaTac and in, into Seattle, and uh, anyways, um, they gave us we had to get new uniforms, and you had to get your greens, and you had to have your patches and all that nonsense. But anyways, I just wanted to go home. So anyways, I went to the airport and they weren't having any flights out till the next day. So I said, I mean, another guy and uh, said, take us to the bus depot. So we went to the bus depot and I took a bus all the way from Seattle to Billings. Hmm. And that was took 24 hours. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> it, it was kind of lonely ride here, but I remember when we got to Missoula, there were three gals from the University of, going to the University of Missoula there, or Montana, and uh, they were sitting, I was sitting towards the back of the bus, they were sitting up front, and anyways, we were going down the road, and they were laughing and stuff, and then one of them, I don't know, she gets got up, turned around, looked at me and says, would you like some divinity? And I go, oh, would I, you know? So I went up there and chatted with him for a little bit, but you know, I don't know, it was like, uh, um, hmm. Yeah, it was just, it was just different, you know, just being back, you know. It's yeah. Like, I mean, I don't want to be in there 24 hours and it's like, I'm, I'm really going home, you know, it's like, Right. Was it a shock, do you think? Or tell um, me about that, yeah. Oh, it wasn't a shock. It was, I think I was happy to be back in the United States. Uh, right. When you got home, what was that like? What was coming back to Billings like? Um, well, my mom and dad come down to bus depot. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was, there was a guy at the bus depot, and he looked at me, and he goes, 
you just coming back from Vietnam? I go, yep. And he goes, boy, I bet your mom and dad are going to be glad to see you. And I said, yep. And they were. Yeah. And then they took me out to the, we went out to Wong Village that night. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, was the, uh, I had a steak, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, at it, the was iron. Just, it was like, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't want any Oreo food now. So, but. Well, it's funny because, yeah, you were just over in the Orient and you're back yeah. in Billings. And yeah. that's, that's a, yeah. What was, um, uh, when you got back, was it hard adjusting back from Vietnam or what happened? Uh, how, how, how did that go? Because it seems to me very interesting that. You go and just a you know a few days earlier you're in Vietnam and now you're sitting in Wong Village in Billings, Montana, half a world away. Oh, I, I don't know. It's it's just like wow, what a trip, man. <laughs> right. You know, that's all I can say. Is it's yeah. like man, it's like. Whew. Was it you know? hard getting back to normal life? Oh. Uh, I don't know if it was really hard, you know. It's, you know, I, I think I was just glad to be back. You know, glad I was back in one piece. Yeah. You know, I mean. Not everybody, because you had seen a lot who hadn't. Yeah. Uh, when people would ask you about, did did were people interested when you came back about what you'd done in Vietnam or what your experiences were like? Most of them weren't. Okay. See, when I came back, I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for a while, mm -hmm. and, then, and then I came back back home, Billings, okay. and uh, I went back to my old job, and I, I, I didn't like that, so um, I do unemployment for a while, and then uh, I worked in oil fields for a while, and then got into construction pretty well. That's what I'd done. Right. Do you think you had changed, or did people think you had changed when you came from, back from Vietnam? Um, yeah, war changes everybody. There's no lying about it. It yeah. changes you. Yeah. Yeah. In what way do you think uh, you were changed? That would have been noticeable if I had known you before you went over and after. What would you? What, what might I say? <laughs> Maybe they just would have said, maybe, wow, you're a hard ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, it had to make I you. I, yeah. what, what, when, when you saw... I just didn't, when I, did, when I came back, I guess in the way it changed me, it was like, I just ain't going to put up with any nonsense. Hmm. Ain't, ain't, ain't going to play no games, yep. you know. It's like, I've been there, done that, you know. I, I, you know, I don't need it, you know. You'd I don't, seen don't need the nonsense, you know? Yeah. You know. So in many ways, you came back probably much more mature. Oh yeah. That was that's not a typical nineteen twenty year old response. No, no. What um, when you came after you came back and you you got back uh, uh, back to the world, are there things that you think Vietnam or your experience in uh, in the army helped you with? Was it a was it positive in some ways? Oh, I think that, yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess er, one of the main things probably taught me about was value of human life. Okay. And the frailty of it. Yeah. You know, and, and the older you get, you know, you, you have losses, mm -hmm. family members, parents, you know, it's uh, it's hard, but. You know, um, I think I think it helped me cope with it. Uh, give me a give me a little more of an edge to cope with it better. Hmm. You know, because you know, time goes on with or without you. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just gonna keep marching on with or without you, and you know. Uh, I thank the good Lord every day for I got a new day. Yeah. You know? No, that's. And I, I think that's what you gotta gotta keep focused on. You know, it's not not what you don't have, but it's what you do have. You know, and if you got family, you're very fortunate. Uh, yeah. Boy, I 
If that's what if I, if that's what you got from from your lessons, wow, very, very, uh, very profound. What did you did when you came back? Did you keep in touch or did you with with either the guys that you were over there with, or did you did you kind of stay involved with things like VFW or stuff, or did you just kind of put the army experience back on? <laughs> A shelf, or how did how did that interplay? How did your experience? It was it something that you drew upon, or talked about, or was did you just not? Well, I was involved with uh, some some veteran stuff for a while when you know, Veterans America and the DAV here, and I don't know. I just I have it for quite a while. I was just. Um, I think you got to DEAV and, and VVA, I think they're good organizations. Uh, I think they do some good, but I, I'm also involved in Vietnam Helicopter Crew Members Association okay. and a uh, member of that. And I think the one I, I like the best though is PVA. Okay. I believe in supporting them. Um, they they do help, and they got some great people working for them. I think they got the best service officers. I mean, it's just all the way around. Right. You know, I've I've had the opportunity to, you know, talking to these people, and and uh, I mean, they've always been there for me. Yeah. And uh, the one 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 neat thing I got to do back in '99, though, I went to Anaheim to uh, Ninth National Vietnam Veterans America Convention. I got to meet Hal Moore, and Colonel Moore was commander of the Battle of the Idrang. Yeah, and I got to meet him personally, and Joe Galloway, and they signed a the book, and yeah. Joe Galloway signed it. Um, he said, thanks for your service. And that's the first time anybody ever told me that, thanks for your service, but he wrote it in the book, thanks for your service. And then Hal Moore signed it, uh, with respect, LZ X-Ray, you know. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yep. And uh, I had talked to him, I, I mentioned to him, he you know, said, I was, well, I'm from Montana, because I said, I, I live about 60 miles from Custer Battlefield. And he goes, I'm very familiar with it. <laughs> yeah. And he was a re le retired lieutenant general then. So yeah. just kind of a little short, blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy, you know. And uh, anyways, that, that was quite quite neat meeting him. And then I got to meet Dale Dye. Do you know who he is? No. Well, he's he's an actor. But he was a, he's a retired Army captain, but he was Marine Corps DI, spent three tours in Vietnam. And uh, I think he's got three Purple Hearts, two Silver Stars. Mm. But he was involved in making the movie Saving Private Ryan, and he's been in some of the Steven Seagal movies, and he was in the movie Platoon, played Colonel. But, but anyways, uh, he asked me, he says, What'd you do in Vietnam? And I said, Army dust officer. He jumps up, shakes my hand, and Nancy Sinatra, she was sitting right next to her. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> right. You know? And he jumps up and shakes my hand. He goes, I know who you guys are. He said, We had two call signs, Marines and Dust Off. And he said, You guys picked me up twice. So uh, I kind of knew a little bit about him prior to meeting him. So, I mean, that was, was kind of neat. There's, there's some really neat people out there. There really are. Yeah. What, what did you, um, have you ever seen the wall in D.C.? No. Is that something you have any desire to do? Um, yeah, it'd be nice, I guess, you know. Right. Like I said, you know, the people we picked up, you know, I really didn't know them. Yeah, because you were just transporting yeah. them. You got them for that but, one. But, I one mean, there's... There's some names on there. My, you know, that's another thing, too. You know, people say, well, you were there in 71. The war was winding down. Uh, well, if you go check for the record, largest aviation campaign in Vietnam fought was in 1971. It was up by Laos. Yep. The intrusion. And the, uh, I can't remember the name of it. But, yeah. I mean. You're right, though. 
there was like 650 helicopters shot down or destroyed. Yeah, they're trying to disrupt the... Hundreds and hundreds of people lost their lives over that one. Yeah. Um, and big battle. Yeah. Did you... Um, so are, now that, that there's a little time between, are, are kids, our family, is, is Vietnam something they're interested in, or do you, do you talk about it at all? Oh, not a lot, okay. but, but sometimes, okay. you know, like I said, my two, two stepsons, they said, no, you need to do this in the son of law. You know? mm -hmm. what, were you wounded at all? Uh, no. So you you survived right. kind Un of a rarity. Un un unscathed. Unsca well, yeah. <laughs> so looking back on it. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's been, well, it hasn't been 50 years, but it's been 45. 45. Five. Yeah. Looking back 45 years, that gives a, a guy a time to think. Uh, how do you view the war now? I mean, do, do, do you view it differently? And if so, what, what's, what's your opinion of it? Well, I wish they would have let the bureaucrats stay out of it, mm -hmm. or keep the bureaucrats out of it, because I really think that that war could have been won. Vietnam veterans didn't lose that war. Politicians lost it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I it. and, you know, if people think communism or socialism is a good thing, well, they need to look at the history. And like I said earlier about what my friend Steve Mason witnessed, yeah. you know, the atrocities. I mean, that's, I can't imagine, you know, having to live that being in fear all the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're so blessed to have our freedoms here, and we're so close to having them taken away right now. It's, it's, it, it scares me. Yeah. You know, because this world is just, it's gone just three, 180. I don't understand it, you know? Right. And people, you know, it's like your, your freedom is important. That's your liberty. If you got liberty or freedom, man, you got it all, man. I mean, <laughs> that's well said. Understated and well yeah, said. You got it all. What is? Um, uh, are there s sights or sounds that take you back to Vietnam, or something that will? You, you mentioned Spanish rice, but are there other yeah. things? That, that kind of instantly transport you there that you associate with Vietnam? Some, sometimes music. If I, yeah. <laughs> sometimes music will put me back, you know. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because most people associate uh, it with a good thing. As music, you know, they like music. Yeah. Some, sometimes, you know, and then sometimes it makes me sad, you know. To yeah. li listening to the, the R&B, you know, it just makes me sad because I think about the guys there and, I mean... It, you know, it affected everybody the same way. But smells, um, the smells not so much. It was like, there for a long time, I think when I came back, I was like, it was like I could never get that smell of dried blood off my hands, hmm. you know? Yeah, it's a distinct. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever, when, when you're over there, I guess, too, the other thing that I've heard a lot about is the weather. Did the weather ever impede you from flying? No. No. Um, we flew in all kind of weather. One time it did. We were up in a triangle. I was on standby, and, and uh, it was raining. And a colonel called and said that had a staff sergeant that was wounded, and it must have been his son-in-law. And he said, you guys got to come. And so we made two attempts going up and uh, went back. And anyways, AC called him back, said, can't do it. And it's raining too hard. And he says, you got to. And he says, well, hold on a minute. And AC looked at me and my medic and uh, Peter Pilot said, well, we can do it. There's a way we can do it. We can go get this guy, but we're going to have to low level. Let's go. Wow. So we leveled the whole mission in the rain, and we went to this one area, and, and uh, we used to fly over, and if we seen elephants, we called Zoomy pilots in and take them out. 
and uh, we knew there was 51 cattle in that area, but we, we were, you know, the guy's American, man. Right, so you got him? So we went in and got him. Were you nervous? Oh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And, and it was like, um, it was it was hard to see. I mean, it was coming down buckets, man. You know, when we're low level, just, yeah. It was kind of hairy, but, uh, yeah. That's got to be a good pilot to do that. To. Oh, yeah. We had some great pilots, and, and uh, uh I've only talked to one other pilot since then, Mr. Francis, and um, he was from Hutchinson, Kansas, or Caney, Kansas. And anyways, he was living out in in Pennsylvania, fl mm. flying flying helicopters wow. for Southern Pacific Railway. Okay. And uh, I talked to him. Oh God, it's probably been 10, 15 years ago. But he was telling me, he says, yeah, he said, I seen, he said, I seen uh, Hogan on TV, and that was during uh, Desert Storm. Hmm. And uh, he said, yeah, he was, he was on TV. And I said, really? I said, yeah, Major Hogan, huh? It was, I, I guess he must have, uh, I don't know. They, I wonder if they recalled him. The hmm. military does that every now and then. They recall guys to... Right. To back to back to service. They need it. You got a critical MOS, you know. They'll call you back. They probably need some pilots. So. Hmm. Hmm. Right. Did you ever uh, have you flown helicopters since? I did in 1988. I I got a ride. A friend of mine. He was a helicopter pilot. Flew for three quarter cap, 25th Infantry, 67, 68. And anyways, uh, he lives out in in uh, Tacoma and he got some Vietnam pilots just back in 88 they were Vietnam pilots but flew for a National Guard and they took me out uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a rush man so, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so now yeah. one of the reasons we're doing this too Dean is because we want to make sure that people in the future if they want to know what Vietnam was like. They can hear people who grew up or lived in Montana, that they don't just have to go and read it out of textbooks or nothing wrong with textbooks or books, but it's different to hear someone who knows what the rims are, knows where Billings is, who was also over there. So as a guy who was over there and served over there, what do you want people to remember about Vietnam from your perspective? From my perspective, mm -hmm. I think they need to they need to know that the people that went to Vietnam, it was an honorable thing. Mm -hmm. I think they need to know that. We we were sent there to to help a country free itself from communism, and it didn't happen. And I think that's. It's what they need to know. Was it hard where you were, wherever you were? I'm guessing you're back here to watch Saigon fall. And I mean, what, yeah, what was that I, like? I, I, I just, I just, you know, yeah, it was. I, I, I've talked to guys that were involved in that before mm -hmm. in the past, and I, yeah. Is is Vietnam? Whether it's movies like Saving Private Ryan, Platoon, uh, or. Uh, uh, whether it's we were books, soldiers. Or, yeah, we were soldiers. Do you watch uh, those things, or do you um, do you read about it, or watch documentaries about it, or movies about it? Is that something that you can do? Um, I seen Save It Private Ryan, and uh, I went to uh, platoon. Went to bunch. There was a bunch of us Vietnam vets here in Billings. Went to it together, and it was I don't know. It was kind of like it was and it wasn't. But when uh, the movie We Were Soldiers came out. Is that like it was? It was pretty much, yeah. Because I remember that we did have them insertions, you know, and it was like them birds just all day until hmm. night. Then the Air Force would come in and, 
And uh, boy, you could watch the, the mountains around us burn orange, you know. Hmm. And then and then they start calling us, and it's like, man, it's like. You were always the next wave because once they started yeah. fighting, yeah. there were injuries. Yeah. Could you be running more than? I mean, were, was it shift work, or could you be running twenty four hours? I mean, how how much could you run at one time? Was it constant, or was it? Oh. Or would they spell you? We, for a while? Oh, I don't know. We could, we put a sixteen hour day in. Nope, nope, you know. Okay, must have been exhausted. Oh yeah, but, you know you got. Yeah, the, I think a few times I put maybe twelve hours flying time in hmm. a day. You know, and it's like, oh yeah, man, it's like, phew. yeah, exhausted. It's like when you finally did have some downtime. Um, it was like. Sometimes towards the end, you know, you're getting your 100 hours. You're looking forward to getting that 100 hours because, you know, you'd have three days off because the aircraft's going to be down. And it's like, I'm going to get a break, you know. So did you have to perform the maintenance or did another crew perform the 100 uh, hour? Yeah, we, the crew chiefs had to help. Okay. But, you know, we had a maintenance crew there that, see, that's what I did when I first started there, you know. And then some guys, they didn't want a crew. They they weren't nutty enough to crew. <laughs> right. What was the hardest part about crewing? <sighs> um, I, I think just the pickups mm -hmm. was the worst. You know, doing the maintenance, you know, you, you just, you know, you're doing it. And... It was a lot of responsibility, you know, until 18 years old, you're given a $310,000 aircraft. And, <laughs> right. And, it's and nutty. No one would do that. You're, you're responsible for the lives of four people, you know, two yep. pilots, uh, um, medic, and yourself. You know, a lot of responsibility, you know. In addition to being shot at, which, ha which would, it sounds like would happen, you know, you'd, you'd, get a, you'd get bullets and stuff like that. Was there ever any mechanical failures? Um, I never had any, but my friend in Denver did. They had a compression stall. They went in and did a Arvin pickup, and then they were up about 75 feet and had a compression stall. And uh, they had to throw them out. Hmm. What's a compression stall? Um, it's just basically when the it's, it's engine stalled. just kind of stalls out, man. You're not getting any power for lift. Hmm. And um, um, yeah, they had to they had to get rid of some weight, and they had to throw a bunch of them guys out. Um, yeah, Jimmy said he 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 had nightmares for that for a long time. He yeah. said watching them guys fall, and then he said it was scary. Or they're gonna start shooting at us. And then Pops, they, he had to go back and pick them up afterward. You know, these guys were already wounded. And then and then, then they had to go back and pick them up after they throwing wow. them out 50, 75 foot, you know. And just, ew, I'm glad I wasn't involved in that. But, um, yeah, we never had any, any, you know, so just, you know, them guys go out and come back shot up. And we call a Chinook, have it come in and. Hauled it up to Dunby 10 up by Cameron. Hmm. I mean, it's amazing. Some of them, them birds were even still flying. You, know, you got these uh, push pull tubes from the swash plate main rotor blade and bullet hole, bullet holes through it. I mean, there's like, you got a quarter inch of steel holding that thing together. How did it manage to stay flying? It's like, Unbelievable. So were the UH ones? They were high maintenance, but they were they pretty tough birds. Oh yeah, yeah. We put them to some some stress. They they you could you you could pull up or drop real quick. You know, you, I mean, you could drop a thousand feet in a matter of seconds. You know, right? Pretty tough landings. I mean, they have to yeah. be built for to take a pretty tough landing, and then yeah. also uh, I imagine. If you if you get shot up, how do you repair that? Um, what if there minor bullet holes? I mean, there's no damage to anything major, you know, technical. Uh, 
you just keep flying. But like I said, you know, he started getting a lot of stuff shot up and we'd call it Chinook and they'd, they'd have to come hoist it out. Rotor blades and things like that we could fix. <laughs> you, you got tail boom or something, you know, you got a couple bullet holes in it. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we'd we wait and we'd get them patched later, you know. Hmm. Uh, the uh, avionics bubbles in the front, we, we could change them out ourselves, you know. Now, most of them also had, did they have a steel plate kind of where the pilot sat? So they had steel plate. Armor, armor plated seats. Okay. Yeah. And they wore a, a flak. 40 pound um, armor vest. I think they were made by Coors. Okay. Porcelain, 40 pound porcelain. That's heavy. Yeah. They said, yeah, they'll keep you alive unless you take a bullet hole in the side and then they'll just ricochet back and forth. So, that's reassuring. But I heard, you know, people have been there a while. And I said, yeah. That can happen. It, it happened. Hmm. Yeah, it happened. Wow. Wow. Well, well, we've covered a lot. Are there any stories that you, you know, you, 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 that I'm missing or anything that we haven't talked about that you want to share? No, I think that pretty well covers it. I think we covered enough. Um, right. Well, I want to, now I'm, I want to say two things to you because they're important. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for coming in and, and sharing your story. I do appreciate it. I couldn't do any of this project, any Vietnam voices without you. And without, uh, I wasn't there, I wouldn't know. So thank you because it takes it takes courage to come in and share that. And I do appreciate it. The other thing is is uh, welcome home and thank you for for serving. You did you did answer the call and I appreciate you doing that. And you saw some of the worst of what war could do. And I think that's important to remember too that war is war. And uh, and I really appreciate it. So on behalf of not only the Gazette but as as a as a citizen who gets to practice journalism in a free society every day, thank you for doing what you did. So. Folks, you. this, you're welcome. This has been Dean Batten. He's with the U.S. Army from 1970 to 1972. This is Daryl Ehrlich with the Vietnam Voices. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening.